I went to Yale and everybody there had been number one in their class and I saw such misery. When I moved to Silicon Valley later, I saw the same. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm like, well, that's great, but does it make you happy? The pursuit of happiness is even in the US constitution. Like there's a sense that we should be happy and if we're not, there's something wrong with us. When you look at the research on happiness, we are never happier than when we're in the present moment. When you are so fully present with what you're doing, that's when your brain is more likely to go into the flow state or in an alpha wave state where you're more likely to come up with innovative ideas. All of the success that you had, all the accolades that you received, your health was withering and you felt energetically low. That's kind of interesting, that dichotomy yes. of this is the happiness lady, yet yes. inside you weren't really embodying that. I realized for myself that you can do all the happiness practices in the world if you're still buying into beliefs and ways of behaving that are self-destructive, that are not life supportive, it doesn't matter. The best way for you to show up for others in this lifetime is to really live your own sovereignty and really take care of yourself. It's radical to sit and do nothing. It's considered, what's wrong with you? Like, why aren't you being productive? They don't realize that our brain is actually in active problem-solving mode and most innovative when we are silent. I oftentimes ask my guests mm -hmm. what their idea of success was when they were younger versus what their idea of success is today. And, yeah. and based on your work with happiness and with sovereignty, you've got an interesting take on success. That's a little bit contradicting what, what our cultural idea of success happens to be. So let's just start yeah. by speaking on that. You know, when I was younger, I guess I thought success was those things society tells us it is, you know, just achieve, achieve, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. That sums it up. I mean, achievement can look different for different people. You know, you can be a social media influencer or you could be a successful actor or whatever, right? So depending on what it is, but it's like this achieving um, and that you know, I think that's a program that just gets instilled in us early, but I have to say it never really rang true for me. And, you know, I went, I went, I went to Yale as an undergraduate and everybody there had been number one in their class and there was such a striving. And I also saw, saw such misery, not just in the undergrads, but the quote unquote successful professors. And, you know, when I moved to Silicon Valley later, I saw the same, you know, I was there for grad school and I was like, Wow. And people are like, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm like, well, that's great. But like, does it make you happy? Or are you just, just not finding the happiness you're seeking? So you got to start another company and another, and then be like, no, I'm a serial, you know, I don't know, you know? And, um, so that was, I, I kind of was like, there's something wrong with this picture, especially because I'd been to China, I'd been to India and Tibet and seen and lived in China for a couple of years and saw people who had absolutely nothing and we're so happy from inside and mm -hmm. grateful. And I just, it made me think, you know, there's this, what, what is, what is success? Like you can have all the outer achievements. You can have glory, fame, beauty, bucks, like whatever, but be miserable. And I think we know a lot of people like that. We can see them. We, you know, otherwise you'd think like everybody who's really successful should be blissed out. They're not right. And then anyway, that was, sort of something I was always questioning. And then now I would say success is inner peace and a fulfilled heart, which often has to do with being able to shine your love on those closest to you, but also possibly others <laughs> beyond you, beyond your little circle, being able to contribute in some way. And it doesn't have to be massive, but it's you making that little ripple effect around you of, of goodness. Um, I, to me, I always feel like, oh, if I were to die now, how would I feel? Would I I'd be like, you know what? I'd be okay right now. I would feel like I've done what I could with my heart, with all my heart. And I don't want to die now. I want to be there for my kids till they grow up at least. <laughs> but that to me is fulfillment. It goes beyond success or happiness. It's fulfillment, you know? And I think we're all looking for that. And it's, and it's so simple and so close to us, actually. It's not close, it's as close as our heart is, right? That's, Absolutely. that's, yeah. What do you think? I mean, I think it's, it's, 
that is the main thing, fulfillment. And, and, and I think people hear that term, right? And they have, we all have different ideas of this. Like even with success as a, as just as a concept, I would, I would imagine that most people aren't necessarily, um, wanting success as much as they want to be happy. Like they equate happiness with success, but it's just our idea of what happiness truly is that I think it's a little bit, yeah, uh, was very subjective, obviously, but I would even say it's distorted yes. because we think of it in terms of external um, stimuli, you know, like getting, making a lot of money will make me happy. Going on vacation will make me happy. Getting a promotion, you know, mm -hmm. and basically checking all those those cultural boxes in terms of, you know, what makes me look good. But I think what you're talking about is what makes you actually feel whole? What makes yes. you, what, what allows you to feel most present, most anchored in the moment? And that's the true sense of, of happiness is that inner peace, that inner content, contentment. And I, I think people hear that and they, they, I think everybody would agree, right? that that's something that I'm definitely striving for. But the question is, how do I get there? How do I achieve it? Mm -hmm. And so then of course you hear, you talk about things like meditation and, you know, you kind of sound like a broken record when it comes to meditation. And I'm not uh, saying that, you know. I'm not saying <laughs> that as an insult, cause that's how I am. I'm always <laughs> talking about meditation. I've taught meditation for many years. I've meditated for many years. So have you, you've been meditating since the mid nineties. So I started meditating in the mid nineties as well. And when you really get into a practice, you start to see that this is, this is the thing everybody's really looking for, <laughs> right? It they is. just don't realize it in the same way that very few people brush their teeth before world war one. And it, it just wasn't a thing, you know, having a toothbrush, everyone would share the same toothbrush and brush their teeth like once every couple of weeks. Now, of course, if the subject of how do you keep your teeth clean came up, it's obvious. You just brush your teeth, floss your teeth, brush your teeth, right? And with meditation, and I've seen this in many of your interviews, inevitably somebody always goes, okay, so what other than meditation, what else can people do? <laughs> and it's kind of like saying, you know, to keep your teeth clean, other than brushing your teeth, what else can you do? What else can you do? It's like, no, just brush your teeth. It's so simple. It's so true there's so much to to what you just said too like this whole thing of happiness like i feel like it's like a um conditioning we receive um that it's it's i mean so psychologists think of us of it as hedonic happiness versus eudaimonic have you heard of that, mm -hmm. that yeah, you, yeah. We, can you explain to the audience the difference yeah so hedonic happiness you can think of as sort of the sex drugs and rock and roll you know all mm -hmm. the all the uh pleasure, all the things that bring you a dopamine high, and they're actually quite self-centered. So um, it could be, you know, food, uh, I mean, like, you know, chocolate or yeah. money or follows on social media or anything that gives you a physical pleasure, a sensual mm -hmm. pleasure, or like a little ego high, right? What, whatever it is, but it's all about you. And the dopamine certainly emerges in your brain. It, it's gives you a little high, but then that high is followed immediately by a dip, which leaves you craving for more. Mm -hmm. And we're in a society that chases those things. And so we're in like a hamster wheel, running, 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 always wanting more. And we can't sustain that form of happiness. But if you look at eudaimonic happiness, which is the happiness we get out of doing out of connection with something beyond ourselves. So for example, mm -hmm. uh, doing community service or helping out a friend or connecting with nature, or if you're spiritual, connecting with the divine or whatever it is, it's beyond you having a greater purpose, you know, working for your local like environmental nonprofit or, you know, whatever it is, that form of, or caring for, for others in whatever capacity, that form of happiness is not a high that comes and goes. It's sustained. And research shows that the people who live lives characterized by compassion, they actually live longer, have lower inflammation at the cellular level, 
um, recover from disease faster, have better psychological health, have better physical health. And my favorite study actually looked at um, a group of people that had gone through very stressful life experiences like war. And those people tend to have shorter lives because they, extreme stress shortens your life. But they mm -hmm. found there was a subgroup of people among those that just kept living these long lives. And they were like, well, what's, what's differentiating these people? And all of them in some way lived lives characterized by compassion. They were involved in community service or something. And it's just so powerful. And I think we all know, what does it feel like to go help a friend in need? You know, we may have been feeling crummy that day, but afterwards you feel amazing. Like mm -hmm. the quote unquote helpers high, but there's nothing better than that. But all of society is marketing at us other things and trying to tempt us. But when you meditate a lot, you start to just see through it. It's like, uh, I could watch that movie or not. I could drink that alcohol or not. I could do this. It's like, it doesn't really, you're not hooked anymore, but you also see through it. And the other day, I have to share this with you because I was talking to this teenager. He'd been meditating forever since he was eight. And I said, so do you think do you feel different from your friends? And he said, yeah, he's like, they're really into like cars and they want a big house. They want a car. I was like, ah, I see through that. And I'm like, wow, man, like if everybody's meditated as a kid, you know, they would be focusing their life on something beyond themselves, you know, something that's actually going to lead to lasting fulfillment, but also wisdom and fun and play, you know, because you can play and have more joy when you're not stuck in mm -hmm. the wanting all the time. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it. I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below. And that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. I think a lot of people have their early experiences with meditation are kind of like yours. Mine was actually similar. Like I hated it. The, the yeah. first experience I, have, I ever had in a, in a proper meditation environment. And both of us ended up sticking with it. So I want you to share your experience of how that, that Korean Zen meditation experience affected you in a, unexpected way and and what compelled you to continue on with it so i would think it was a sophomore in college and um and meditation was considered very weird in the mid 90s it was like we had like one classmate who meditated and they were like that guy meditates that's so weird he also like walked around barefoot and with a stick and <laughs> you know there was just it was just considered a bizarre thing um Smell now like i'm like i'm now i'm walking barefoot <laughs> but anyway um Anyway, so I had a crush on somebody and he was going to this meditation thing. And I was like, she's like, maybe I can meet him there. So I would, I went, I was like, I'm going to go do this weird thing. It wasn't the guy, the barefoot guy it was another guy. Anyway. Um, so I go there with my roommate because I'm, you know, I was super introverted and shy and, it, and she is too. And so we were just like, going to go together. <laughs> so we went there and we sat and it was this like very strict uh, Korean Zen instru instruction sit for an hour eyes half closed, looking down the carpet, no instruction. So I got to know that carpet really well. And I also figured I was never going to do that again because it was just so painful to sit there without moving for an hour when you're 19 years old and you've never done this before. And there, and it was quite austere, you know? Um, and so when I left, I was like, oh, I feel more peaceful, but I'm never doing that again. <laughs> and then the next day, so I at the time I had an eating disorder for about maybe two or three years where I would binge when I was feeling low when I was feeling down and I would feel down a lot. And from a um, breakup, right? After you, this, you broke um, up. You? Yeah, I guess it was sort of, I had a breakup around this. Yeah. My teens. And then after that, I started to, um, yeah, I started to, I think I just did not know how to handle the emotions. We don't get instruction on that in school mm -hmm. or anywhere. Right. And uh, I was trying to cope. And, um, anyway, so I would binge whenever I was feeling down and then I would cry after and I would feel terrible. And it was just a cycle. It was like an addiction. I feel like I think of it as like an addiction, you know, it's like this, uh, compulsive coping mechanism to try and feel better. 
using an external substance and it'll never work. But so many of us are stuck in it, whether it's eating or drinking alcohol or watching movies, you know, on repeat or whatever, just like we just don't want to feel, you know, in our society, we like, if you feel bad, there's something wrong with you. You know, that's how we think about it. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, going back to this moment, the next day I came into my room and I, my dorm room and I was feeling low again. And there was this like really gross pizza lying there that looked awful. And I was like, great, I can binge again now. But then this light bulb went off in my head and it said, you always cry after you binge. Why don't you cry first? And I'd never had that insight before ever in my life. Had I had the insight, had I had enough self-awareness and space between the, to actually see what was going on in my own behavior. And I was like, okay, let me try that. So I lay on my bed. I still remember the blanket I was lying on and I cried my eyes out. And then when I was done, I sat up and I realized I don't binge anymore. And I never binged again, nor did I ever, uh, go into any other coping mechanism. I realized I need to go through the emotion. And when the emotion is completely uh, experienced, just like a child, they're angry for like two minutes and they're done. When it's completely experienced, it's out, you know? So anyways, um, that was my, you know, realization of just how powerful meditation can be. And uh, that started a, you know, I never dated that guy, but it started a, a definite long-term romance with meditation and now it's been over 20 years. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's rewind a little bit more and just talk. Uh, you grew up in Paris, um, I believe, and I, want, I would love to hear more about your upbringing in terms of what was your what was the vibe like in your household? What were the ideologies that your parents, you know, instilled upon you? Um, and what 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 do you feel were the breadcrumbs to you becoming an academic? I mean, growing up in Paris sounds really romantic and. And it's really beautiful and you know you absorb the culture in a profound way and it's it's quite amazing but also um french people tend to be really negative at least in paris at least when i was growing up <laughs> i don't want to generalize maybe things have changed but are tend to be quite negative focused on the negative focused on what's wrong with you what's going wrong things are never going to work out that's and as a child you grow up in that atmosphere and you just feel like oh my gosh there's no hope everything's bad and you feel really insecure, like all these things. Right. And, and that, you know, but there were, there were always a lot of books around my house. So I, I definitely just, and we didn't have TV, which I'm so grateful for. Now I, I, I don't have TV in our home either. Cause I was like, this is great. Growing up without was actually awesome. Even though I complained, but I read all the time. I read all the time. And, um, and I, I was just curious, you know, I was curious about the deeper things in life. And I was curious about the spiritual aspects of life. And they weren't really talked about. And um, it just kind of went through it, you know, in Paris, when you grow up in Paris as a young, as a girl, as a kid, you're you lose your uh, innocence really, really young because of how aggressive uh, men are in the streets as of probably age 11 or 12. That's it. You are in for it. You're prey. Um, so it was just intense. It was an intense experience and, you know, beautiful in some ways and other ways. It was just, it just felt a little bit dark and negative. Um, and, um, but I always had this interest in like the lighter aspects of life, you know, and I was looking for them in books and so forth. And then, then, then I came, like I said, I came to Yale as an undergrad, um, and then I was like, wow, people here are more positive in the U.S. I like that. But I saw people really driving themselves into the ground, too. And I thought, oh, my gosh, they're more positive here. I like that. And I stayed. I've never, I, I stayed in the U.S. after that. I didn't go back to France. I didn't ever move back. But um, but I also saw the suffering that's here from, from this um, belief I am what I do, which I think is very much American culture. And... Um, and this accomplishment culture, which is also awesome and reason why America is so productive, but also uh, there's some suffering there. And so it wasn't until I went to China and India and Tibet that I saw, okay, this is, they got something going on here. That's awesome. They have the inner wealth. You know, we have the outer wealth here. They have the inner wealth there. And that is the only wealth really worthwhile because some of them have absolutely nothing. They have nothing but they have a smile like you don't even see here, you know? They have a connection, a sense of belonging with each other. It's extraordinary. 
And you don't see that just in East Asia, you know, I was just making me think of a story. My sister was just in, in Mali and, um, and she said she was on a bus riding and this woman was breastfeeding her child and she fell asleep. And you know what the person next to her did? The, the woman next to her, she grabs the baby and starts breastfeeding it. Do you see the sense of belonging? I mean, here you'd be arrested <laughs> because of the lack of connection and ah, freaking out, but like the sense of belonging that exists in certain more traditional cultures is what we're looking for. You know, that connection, the sense of family, and they may not have wealth on the outside, but they have a wealth within themselves and in their connection to each other and an understanding of what's really important. What, what do we all want? We want to feel connected to ourselves and to one another. Mm -hmm. so that's what we want, <laughs> you know, in a positive way, obviously. So anyway, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. I went off on a tangent there, but. No, <laughs> just... this is great. This is great. I've spent a lot of time in India as well, and I've described it as people, it's a very chaotic place, as you know, right? It's loud and it's there's dogs and cows and very everything's chaotic. all around and you're having to constantly dodge cow, sh uh, cow shit in the streets. and. But when you see some of these people who don't don't have a lot compared to what Americans have kind of normalized um, materially, you you can see this sort of inner peace within in their eyes and in their presence and in their reverence for things like rivers and mountains and you know and nature. Yes. Whereas in America, where we have everything compared to other people in the world and we have this sort of inner chaos you yes. look in our eyes and there's this like inner anxiety and this constant low grade tension and we're always worried about what's going to happen next and so again i think these are sort of clues into this greater sense of fulfillment that you see in these so-called third world countries these developmental countries where, where really they're just they're still operating closer to how we normally operate as humans in our own evolution, right? We're, in, we're tribes, families, helping yeah. each other out, um, working closer to nature, these kinds yes. of things. Oh. Yeah. I mean, that's why I wrote Sovereign because I was like, even as a psychologist, I was like, there's no, no word for that, that inner wealth. And even psychology has created a term for it because it's a Western science mostly, you know, and we didn't, but that is, that exists. And it's something we can accomplish. But like you said, we've come so far from it, especially like with nature, like you're saying, we're so far from it. We, we, we don't connect with, we don't realize that, oh, well, I was born seven or eight pounds and all the extra weight I've gained since then is a hundred percent from nature. I mean, there's a lot of chemicals thrown into American food, but like it's weird. We're part of nature and yet we live so distant from it. And so many other things that more ancient indigenous way of life is, what we were wired for. Mm -hmm. And what's it, what's ironic is that you wrote a book called the happiness track, which yeah. basically lets us know that, Hey, happiness is an inside out phenomenon. And you talked a lot about meditation and stuff, but then you also said in your most recent book that with all of the success that you had through the happiness track, you know, all the millions of views and the thousands of copies sold and, and, just all the, the accolades that you received, your your health was withering and you felt energetically low and your heart broke daily because you weren't able to take care of your kids properly and all of this. So that's kind of interesting, you know, that dichotomy yes. of this is the happiness lady, yet yes. inside you weren't really embodying that. And then that's what kind of led to this new body of work that you're now really excited about. So let's talk about that transition. Yeah. I mean, you know, I realized for myself, but also just looking around me, cause I teach, um, I teach executives at the Yale school of management. That's my, one of my main things mm -hmm. that I do. And I would see super successful people also. And yet such a um, lack of, lack of fulfillment. So, you know, I realized you can do all the happiness practices in the world, but you're, if you're still buying into beliefs and ways of behaving that are self-destructive, that are not life supportive, 
it doesn't matter. I mean, maybe it matters a little bit, but it doesn't make a difference if we're not aware of the patterns in our thoughts and in the type of behaviors we engage in. And that is the sovereignty aspect. And again, that's why I wrote, I chose that word because it's, um, it, we don't really have a term for it in psychology yet. And uh, so, yeah, so, you, you know, you could you do your gratitude lists and do your meditations and so forth. But if you're still engaging in thoughts of self-loathing, for example, you know, and a lot of people will be like, I don't have self-loathing. But every audience I ask when I say, how many of you are self-critical? 90 to 95 percent of people raise their hand. Mm-hmm. And when I ask them, OK, so what do you say to yourself when you make a mistake? They'll say horrible things, you know, like you're such an idiot and worse. I mean, when you look at it, the lists, when the people, you know, post them in the chat, what they say to themselves, it's just so sad and it breaks your heart. Um, and so when you look at it from a psychological perspective, self, self-criticism is a form of self-loathing. And what's really fascinating is those couple of people in the room who don't raise their hand, they often are so powerful in their presence is so powerful because they're in a life supportive relationship with themselves. Does that make sense? They, they, and, and that's actually the only thing that makes sense. It's like, um, you know, I, I always think of these two quotes, one by Maya Angelou. She always says, she wrote, um, I learned a long time ago that the only thing that makes sense is to be on my own side. And, you know, so beautiful. And then Audre Lorde, is also a writer and also an activist and playwright and self-described gay black woman in a straight white man's world, um, fighting battles on many fronts. Um, and she said, self-care is not self-indulgence. It's an act of political warfare. Mm. And I love that quote, you know, because it just, you know, we just think self-care is like a frivolous or it's just like, meaningless elective, optional elective elective <laughs> yeah and no like how are you going to show up on the battlefield of your life you're going to show up limping and sick because you like kicked yourself there and didn't sleep or you're going to show up powerful beyond measure because you loved your way there so that's just one example of you know the base and then i talk about that in the first chapter because i'm like if you don't have a sovereign relationship with yourself you're that's the base. Like you got to start there. And most of us due to social conditioning, social programming, whatever you want to call it, are in a toxic relationship with ourselves. You know, we can complain about toxic relationships with other people, but it's like, look at your relationship with yourself. And if you can turn that around, then that is definitely the foundation for sovereignty. Mm-hmm. And it's a wonderful thing. It's an amazing thing, but it's, it's almost so, you know, you were saying like, we're so come so far from nature and from more traditional ways of living that a lot of people feel really far from that too, that connection. And meditation is definitely one way to start to develop that. I also feel like one of the reasons why we're so far away from seeing self-care as, as mandatory, as, as mandatory as we see brushing our teeth, showering, you know, feeding ourselves a few times a day is because we don't equate it with our basic needs. We equate it with sort of the self-actualized part of the hierarchy of needs, right? Once I, yeah. once I save up enough money, once I, you know, get promotion, once I have generational wealth, then I'll think about fulfillment. Then I'll think about being sovereign with my <laughs> eternal self. And so, but what ends up happening, and I think you alluded to this earlier with a lot of your colleagues and people you were working around and people you work with today, the CEOs and the high level execs, is that the lack of fulfillment, the lack of sovereignty ends up causing you to pursue things that, that aren't really aligned with what you may be truly here to do, because you're looking to fill the void. You're looking to fill the hole that you have inside of yourself. Whereas if you prioritize the fulfillment and the sovereignty in the beginning, it would inform your next steps along your own, your path. And you may end up doing things and being curious about things and allowing yourself to have the courage to pursue things that are more aligned, but that may be perceived as being a little bit weird to your, your neighbors and your family and stuff like that. But ultimately you'll end up in a a space where you're stable, you've stabilized 
that sense of fulfillment and inner peace. Yes, I love that you said that, Light. And it's like, um, you know, the Yale undergrads here, my colleagues run a study with them. And I, I think it's so meaningful because it's so hard to get into Yale. It's like this tiny percentile of people get in. And my colleagues asked these undergrads, okay, so what emotion do you feel the most? And you would think they feel successful and happy, but they said stressed and tired. Okay, that's deflating. But then when they were asked, like, what emotion do you want to feel the most? It was loved. Mm. And you just think, wow, all overachievers everywhere, and perfectionists and whatever, are looking for that. And yet no amount of accomplishment, reputation, fame, even relationships will make up for the hole in your heart due to a lack of friendship from yourself. And, and that's just the truth of it. And so you see people pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. But like you said, no, you got to fulfill. You can. Why not? You want to be president? Be president. You want to be CEO? Be CEO. Great. Enjoy. But make sure you take care of that hole in your heart as a foundation. You're going to be even more successful. And you're going to actually find what you're looking for and show up in a much stronger, more powerful way. How do you define sovereignty? When you use that word, what are you actually talking about? I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about, which is why I wrote a whole book on it, but I guess one, <laughs> you know, one sort of overview word. Would What's be, a way for someone listening to this to remember that in a very yeah. easy, easy way, you know, just, just so they can associate that, that word with this yes. conversation. Well, the way that I write about in the book is I talk, talk about the bound state and then the sovereign state. And the bound state is when we are, you know, in a place where, when we're, when we're in fear, when we're not able to show up as we wish when we re don't are not living the life that we want to be living. Um, Seventy percent of people regret not living the life they wanted to live on their deathbed. If you think about it, it's tragic. Mm -hmm. And there's many, many ways of being bound, right? And then the sovereign state is when you are actually in a life supportive relationship with yourself and are able to live at your highest potential. Well, you refer to it as internal freedom. And oh, yes, a, a relationship with yourself so profoundly life supportive and energizing right. that you can access your full potential, which is going to lead me to my next question, which is, how do you know you're living your full potential? I, like, let's say somebody is not very self critical, but maybe they're not fully um, aligned with their work, or whatever life they constructed for themselves. How, how does one know that they're living their full potential? I think, like you said earlier, it's really essential to be self-aware and, you know, practice like meditation help here. So you actually um, are in touch with yourself and what you want. You know, mm -hmm. I think we all have things that we wish for and that we want and that we have dreams, you know, and maybe your dream is just to have a really happy family. That's, that's an amazing dream. Like, go for it, you know. Um, whatever your dream is, maybe you have a professional dream, maybe you have a social dream that you want to contribute in some manner. Um, and are you doing it? Are you getting off the couch? Are you doing it? Are you able to um, go to sleep at night feeling contented with what you did and not, not regretting that you're not doing something? You know, I think we all have a very unique life trajectory. We all have very unique desires like my sister since she was a child a child all she thought about was horses 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 and then she went on to vet school and she didn't get in the first time and then she had to go and do the second round of exams this in france you have to do the exams and she got in and then she it, it's a very difficult trajectory she got two phds in the field doing so much research and to this day she's in her 50s she's a horse vet you know which means getting up at night it's like a full time all around the clock like you don't have she doesn't have kids nothing this has been she's here for the horses you know what i mean that's so clearly her even we were on a trip to mexico and someone was like hey let's go see the local shaman and we didn't know what what that was but we were like sure we went and he was like okay draw a card for your guardian angel and the card she pulls is a horse and she's born in the <laughs> Chinese zodiac year of the horse. I mean, it's like <laughs> she's here for them, you know? I mean, we all have such unique ways that we contribute. And what I've noticed, you know, I lead a class at the Yale School of Management called the Reflect the Best Self exercise where people 
before coming to class in the few months before, they reach out to colleagues, friends, family, and ask them about times when they showed up as their best self. So ask for this sort of positive feedback about themselves. And people read it and then right before the class and they show up and they're like, I cried. Like, I, I, I don't even remember some of these anecdotes they're sharing. I don't remember them. I'm like, yeah, you don't remember them, but you changed that person's life forever and they'll never forget that moment. You know, and how many people are walking around thinking, ah, I'm just this person. What difference do I make? We don't even realize the many ways in which each one of us shows up as a gift for other people. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of heartbreaking that way. But I think being highly self-critical plays into that, right? We're always just like so aware of our faults as opposed to also being aware of the things we do bring. And, and in that way, we, we fulfill a purpose. You refer but, to it as the shoulds, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think that's something that I actually use that in my, in my keynote speaking as well, this nice. stop, stop shooting on yourself, which is stop, <laughs> stop, stop allowing the cultural ideas of what success is supposed to be influence yes. those decisions you make for yourself, but it can't be, and you talk about this, it can't be an intellectual exercise. You have to take action. You have to really challenge those beliefs yeah. by acting on what you feel is aligned with, yes. with what you're here to do. But in order to do that, you have to un sort of unbound yourself to those cultural mm -hmm. indoctrinations mm -hmm. and you have to start to tether yourself to your intuition. And you talk about that near the end of your, near the end of your book, but I'm, I'm curious now, since you just told me about your sister and her fascination with horses, Having been very close to that uh, that evolution in your sister, do you do you feel that we are sort of spiritually bound to a certain destiny when we come here, and and that is really what informs what feels aligned and what doesn't feel aligned, and that informs when we know we're living our full potential. Do you believe in that kind of thing? Or what, what's your, cause I know you come from a very science background and, you know, there's no scientific studies that talk about that. So what's your sense of, of, of destiny, of spiritual contracts or whatever you want to call them, karma, dharma, what do you, what do you think about all that? I mean, I'm a scientist by profession, but I definitely have a spiritual life. Uh, it's interesting in academia, you have to keep that all in the closet. Mm -hmm. which I'm not buying into anymore. As you can see in my new book, I'm just like, all right, I'm laying it out there. Like we're all just people. And we have, some of us have spiritual lives. Some of us have, we all have emotional lives. Like, so yes. I mean, do we have, now I don't know. I mean, do we have a prescribed destiny? I, I can't say that I know. I have, who knows really, right? I don't know. Um, but I do know that I have heard a calling within myself. Mm -hmm. And I remember as a little kid being like, I'm going to be a writer. And I also said, I'm going to be a nun, <laughs> which is funny because I wasn't even in a church. But I think maybe that was, you know, the meditation aspect of my life. I think yeah. when you spend, uh, you know, about an hour every day for decades meditating, there's a certain part of you that has embraced a life of introspection and some kind of devotion. Um, and uh, so for myself, um, I've always felt a calling and a, like a I kind of knew, okay, I, I got to, I got to take this job or I got to go to this college. I just had this feeling like this is what I should be doing and uh, what I not should, but this is what I feel called to. Now that's a little different from the shoulds because the shoulds also came in, but the shoulds are often constraining, you know, like, oh, I should always look professional or something, you know, like I need to keep things. And that's why in my last book, I'm like, all right. I'm done. Like, <laughs> this is me. This is my personal embarrassing. I, pr I put all the most personally embarrassing stories that I have in there. There's maybe one or two missing that they, that I had to edit out, but um, you know, there's ton of, tons of science and everything, but I, I think we're, we're all complex a combination of a lot of things. So I've always personally for myself felt like I had something, a mission that I had in mind and I've, I knew I wanted to write. I knew I wanted to speak on these topics. I knew I wanted to help people. That was really, really clear. But I think you also learn some of it through your life. Like I was always super shy, but my first job was teaching Pilates in Shanghai, which <laughs> I had to find a job. And anyway, long story, but my first job was teaching Pilates in Shanghai. And I was like, oh my gosh, 
I love doing this. I was like, am I going to be a Pilates teacher? Is that going to be what I'm going to do with my life? But then I realized later is, oh, no, I love teaching stuff to people that makes them feel really good. And that makes them feel better about them, about themselves in life, you know, and then that's kind of what I ended up doing, but through a, a very different route. Yeah. And I would say also with the meditation practice, what ends up happening, even if you don't believe that this is going to happen or you, you're a complete skeptic is at some point without fully realizing it, it's like your brain gives the wheel, hands the wheel over of your life over to your intuition and you start to operate from your intuition more. You start making more decisions based on that internal sense of mm -hmm. what's what's for you and what's not for you, which I've often described as, you know, if it's not for you, it makes you feel contracted. And if it is for you, it's still going to be scary, right? Because it's going to require you to take a leap of faith, but it makes the possibilities make you feel expansive. And yes. so you just get a little more courage. And you talk about this as one of the byproducts of your 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 uh, your work with sovereignty is you get yeah. more courage, you get more strength, you get more boldness, and those are some of the telltale signs that you're starting to live a more sovereign sovereign life. And I, and I also like to look at these things on a spectrum, and I think that's one of the hard. That's why it can be hard to define these terms because they're not absolute. And we like to make things absolute in our society. <laughs> you know, it's all good or it's all bad. It's not. But really, it's a spectrum, and, and everyone is living a sovereign life to a degree. Maybe it's mm -hmm. just twenty percent of the time, but eighty percent of the time, it's yes. stressed, it's worry, it's anxiety, it's doubt. And so, the idea behind this is, yeah, you employ these different techniques that you list in the book, and it moves the needle from twenty percent, maybe to thirty percent after a few months, maybe to forty percent after a year, maybe, and then maybe like you, when you get up to sixty percent, sixty-five, seventy percent. Then for the most part, you're living a sovereign life, but then there's still some experiences that you're having, like you, you know, missing your keynote speech when you're out at the park with your kids and it stings and you, 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 you default back to the inner terrorist, but then you're able to move, move past it. And I think that's one of the, the signs of progress that I've, I've, I've detected in your book is you're able to move past things a lot easier. Does that, does that mm -hmm. sound accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And especially the courage piece, because I think a lot of people, a lot of us are in stuck in a way of life that we don't feel fully sovereign in because we're afraid. We're afraid of what people will think. We're afraid of not looking normal. We're afraid of taking risks. We're afraid of losing love. We're afraid of all the things. And so we start to box ourselves into a place where it's like, wow, with all that fear, I'm not living the life I want, you know, but I don't even know it. And I'm anxious and depressed and I don't understand why, you know, mm -hmm. and courage is like you said, taking those leaps of faith and, and, be, and uh, making those sovereign choices. But the more aligned you are with yourself, and like you said, meditation can really make you more aligned with yourself, with that inner voice, um, the more you're going to be able to live a, a generous life, not just for yourself, but for everyone else. Because for every person who shows up in a sovereign way and is living the life that they really feel aligned with, they become like a gift for everyone. Like I said, those couple of executives in the room that are that are sovereign that I meet the ones that are not self-critical and that, I mean, the power they exude is something else, you know, it's something else. And they are a role model for everyone in the room. And I have to say, it's rare to meet a fully sovereign person. It is. But when you do, you don't forget them. You just don't. And so what that means is all of us, when we're aligned with our sovereignty, we can make our mark in the unique way that we are like, like you're uniquely, you know, presenting your work, giving your talks, creating the content that touches people. If you are not aligned with yourself, all these people that get inspired by you would not who would, they would be missing something in their life, you know, that and the people you're helping are then then they're getting in touch with their own selves more and as a consequence they're inspiring others it's this huge ripple effect so i always think you know sometimes people think oh well why should i take care of myself and my 
sovereignty and my whatever I need to take care of others. It's like, well, actually, the best way for you to show up for others in this lifetime is to really live your own sovereignty and really take care of yourself. That's how you are not only show up at your best, but you also model it for others. Like, what are you going to model for your kids? You're going to you're like a burnt out, stressed out, self-critical person. You're going to tell them that's how they live. And then they're going to live like that. Because how did where do we learn it from from others? And so that's right. It's yeah, like a program. <laughs> so and, and particularly when it comes to, um, you know, not not being at our best, which obviously is a part of the human condition is you're not going to be at your best all the time. Right. That's why I love that that story about the keynote that you told because we've all had that experience your heart just drops <laughs> you know when they shame yeah. yeah and just for the listeners you know you 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 were, you had a scheduled virtual keynote you were at the park with your kids you forgot you got the text message are you having trouble logging on oh and you're man like, oh, yep. <laughs> you're like 45 minutes away from home but we those kinds of experiences when you have them, obviously we can beat ourselves up over that and, oh my God, I'm so stupid. I'm such an idiot, blah, blah, blah. But what ends up happening oftentimes is later on, maybe years later, the same thing will happen to someone else. Like, and you're involved in your, as an organizer. And then because you've been there, mm -hmm. then you're able to have a lot more empathy and a lot more compassion for the other person. So and that could yeah. be the purpose behind going through those kinds of experiences. So yeah. if we can, if we can reverse engineer that back to the real time present moment, when we're the ones making the mistakes and just still do the best we can, you know, record the thing, send it to them and, and, and then move on from that understanding that, oh, okay, this is something that's happening to me. That's going to allow me to have more compassion and empathy, to be a better storyteller, to, to write a book and do it a little chapter in the book about this, like, you don't know where these things are going to be going, but it, at the end of the day, it will be used for good. And I think that's yeah. a really healthy way to sort of move on from that. But it's a lot easier as you kept going back to when you're doing the inner work, when you're becoming more self-aware, when you're doing the meditation. And that's why it's so important to incorporate that into your day-to-day -day life as an essential, not as a, as a nice to have, but as a must have. Yes, absolutely. And all the periods of suffering, you know, it's so interesting because, you know, the pursuit of happiness is even in the U.S. Constitution. Like there's a sense that we should be happy. And if we're not, there's something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. Like, well, that's not the view in other cultures like China, India, even Germany. Like there's not a sense that you're like, you should just never be unhappy, but or suffer or in a place of suffering. And the, the truth is that, like you said, and I've heard, I heard Thich Nhat Hanh say this once, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, I'm sure many of your audience have heard of. And he, he, we, he was being interviewed at the university where we would organized this talk. And he said, um, do not wish only happiness on your children, for it is through hard times that they learn compassion. And, you know, it's through the times that we have suffered and been in pain that our heart has stretched and that we've understood. I still remember that at 16. Oh, I had my first heartbreak, you know, and I was like, oh, others hurt like this too, because I hurt, I know others hurt, right? And so that stretches, like you said, your compassion muscle and also your endurance and your forbearance and your uh, wisdom, you know, because then when you've gone through hard times, then, you know, it's like when someone dies or you are you almost die, then you're like, oh, life it's a good thing it's a cool thing it doesn't last forever let's like totally be in it and be freaking grateful and just mm -hmm. be present for it you know <laughs> mm -hmm. talk about trauma imprints because i think that's something when people talk about listening to their heart and their intuition sometimes you could be accidentally listening to your trauma imprint so what is that yes. and how can it how can it impact our way of thinking about things yes you know so when you're trying to tap into your intuition, which, you know, research is now showing can help you really make better decisions, especially when matters are complex. Neuroscience research shows you can make a better decision if you go with your gut feeling mm -hmm. over trying to think through all the details constantly. Um, 
But as you try and listen to your intuition, first of all, like you said, it's so important to meditate so you can differentiate all the noise, right? We take in over 60,000 gigabytes of information every day. So that's a lot of noise in your head, not to mention your whole past, including potential trauma and other things you're taking in. How are you supposed to decipher what's a gut feeling and what's just a passing thought that's caused by something you heard, right? So um, one of those things, those aspects is, is trauma. And if you have significant trauma, you know, meditation can certainly help. But in some cases, meditation can feel really hard because you just become really aware of the anxiety. Um, I lived in New York City during 9-11. And after that day, I had so much anxiety. My body would shake in the morning at 830 before leaving my apartment. And um, I tried all the things, you know, I went to Bikram yoga like five times a week. <laughs> I went to the Tibet house and like hung out with Tibetan monks, you know, hoping for like peace by osmosis. I, I just did all the things. Meditation was making me more anxious because I just got more aware of just how, how stressed my system was. And, um, and it wasn't until I walked into a breathing class um, offered by a nonprofit called Art of Living they offered this class at Columbia where I was um, and it, it, it teaches a breathing practice called sky breath meditation. And um, I, I thought, what the heck is this? <laughs> and, um, and I did the class and I thought, Oh, this isn't going to work. Just a bunch of breathing. How can this help me? And then they said at the end, they're like, okay, practice this for 40 days. And I said, fine, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm going to practice this for 40 days because I don't think this is going to work. And, um, and I did, I practiced it for 40 days. Now fast forward, 20 years later, I'm still <laughs> been practicing every day because it made such a difference. And I was able to just sort of move on and just successfully finish grad school and just kind of start cruising through life. Uh, like I hadn't been able to, you know, with all that anxiety. So, um, and then fast forward 10 years later, I was working with veterans with trauma, with combat trauma for whom traditional medication and therapy hadn't worked. And what my colleagues were seeing is, you know, mindfulness, they were not responding to it because a lot of them were dropping out because they don't want to sit there becoming more aware of their anxiety and their perhaps the images and so forth that come up in their mind. So I thought, you know, the breathing work for me, let's try it for them. And I got a grant and we ran a study, an initial study. And um, after one week of learning this breathing practice, the veterans, they said to me things like, I remember everything that happened, but I can move on. And they got out of there. You know, many of them were bunkered up in their basement, drinking and smoking weed just to try and make it through. They got married, got jobs, moved on. I mean, it's there was a documentary made about it called Free the Mind. And uh, you can see, you know, this the shift. The shift is amazing. It was actually the most moving study I've ever run, you know. And uh, we re recently replicated it uh, in collaboration with the Palo Alto VA Hospital. And they... Um, also looked at at some physiological markers. We did too look at physiological markers and saw, imp saw also improvements. But we found that they f the VA found that the the sky breath meditation was as powerful as the current gold standard therapy for uh, post traumatic stress, and also superior to it in 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 terms of at the level of the brain with regard to emotion regulation and so forth. So really interesting you know um and so to me i it's a way oh wow like they they regain i regain my sovereignty they regain their sovereignty over that trauma because if you have a certain trauma then you're going to look at the world through that lens like you had a traumatic relationship every new relationship you're going to think you're going to be in that you know the new person didn't do anything wrong but you <laughs> are in that fear you know we get stuck we're, we're afraid there's so many different forms of, of fear that we run around with that keep us blocked from from being who we want to be what is, um, what is the gold standard yeah. treatment for trauma, for post-traumatic? Cognitive stress? processing therapy. Which yeah. means what? You know, I'm not an expert in that, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, uh, yeah. It's like, I, I, but it sounds it, like you're talking through it and you're reliving it and trying to figure out what-, what Cognitive what processing therapy. I have to say, I'm not an expert, but the cognitive aspect is certainly trying to deal with the thoughts, but- uh, the processing, I'm not, I, I just, I can't speak to it exactly, except that I know that it's, it's what the VA considers is the gold standard mm -hmm. therapy. But um, one thing that's really interesting about psychology is that there's, 
the paradigm that we're in is that, you know, change your thoughts, change your life. I mean, I think there are books with that title. Sure. It's like, that's all well and good if things, if, you know, shit isn't hitting the fan, you know, <laughs> but when things are really intense, try changing your thoughts and changing your life. It's not going to work. You know, it's like if you're in the middle of a rage or an, of an anxiety attack and you're going to, you're going to talk your way out of there. We know that you can't because what happens at the level of the brain is that the amygdala and the older centers of the brain are, are they, you're in fight or flight yeah. and you lose, uh, there's loss of prefrontal activation, which means you lose the ability to use your prefrontal cortex, which is your ability to reason and logic. You lose it when you're in this very intense fight or flight activation. That's why you can't talk a kid out of a tantrum, but you can't talk yourself out of it either. And you can't talk someone, you know, when someone comes up to you and they're like, hey, and you're, you're feeling anxious and they're like, hey, you should calm down. And you're just like, oh my gosh, that's so not helpful. You know, they're, that's at the level of the brain. It's like, we don't have that cap capability. And so what the breathing does is it calms your nervous system and taps into your parasympathetic, or the opposite of the fight or flight. As you calm your body, your nervous system, your brain starts to come back online. You're able to think clearly again. It's really powerful. Do you want me to share a story with regard to that? Yeah, please. So about 10 years ago, my husband walked in and, he's, and he was pale. And I said, what's going on? And he said, Jake was in an IED. So Jake was his friend who's a Marine Corps officer in charge of um, the last Humvee on a convoy going across Afghanistan. And they all passed safely, but his drove over a roadside bomb. And in that moment, I don't think we can imagine what that feels like, the shrapnel flying, the massive explosion, the fear, the panic, the noise, the everything. In that moment, uh, when the dust settled and he looked down, his legs were severely damaged. And usually someone would just pass out at that point. It's this huge trauma. But he remembered a breathing practice that he had read about for what to do in this time of wartime sort of extreme situation. And it was this breathing practice he started to engage in. And as he did that, he was able to, it calmed his nervous system. So he, is, he was able to think clearly. Despite his injury, he was able to do his first act of duty, which was to check on the other service members in the vehicle, to do this, his second act of duty, which was to give orders to call for help. And it even gave him the presence of mind to tourniquet his own legs and then to prop them upward before lying down and falling unconscious. And then he was urgently transported to Germany and Walter Reed. And he was told if he hadn't done these things, he would have bled to death that day. He would have died. He lost both his legs. That's how severe it was. But he's alive. He's in the US. He's a stay at home dad. He's awesome. <laughs> and because he knew how to use his breath, you know? And so again, this is a, a way for us to regain our sovereignty mm -hmm. despite the stress of life. So. It's free the mind. Is it streaming on, is it on YouTube? Can people find it on? Amazon? Yeah, I think you can find it. Yeah. I think you can, uh, there's a website for it, I believe. And if you just Google free the mind in my name, you'll be able to find it. Okay. Um, and give and, us a, uh, a, yeah. a little, uh, synopsis of the, of the sky yeah. breath technique. Mm -hmm. So the sky breathing technique is something you should learn from a trained instructor. I, I saw their <laughs> stuff on YouTube, but I really don't know what that is. And I, we haven't done research on that. So I, I would recommend like taking a class. Um, if, there, if you're military or related to military or veterans or anything like that, you can do it through Project Welcome Home Troops. They offer it at no cost for military and veterans and their families. And then this other nonprofit, Art of Living, where I learned it, they offer it over like a weekend Zoom class. But it, it what you come out of that class with is a 25 minute practice, daily practice. That is a combination of different forms of breathing. Um, and together, it seems to have this effect, at least we're seeing from the data and I saw personally myself in myself and the veterans. Um, but in terms of like a short, short exercise that someone can just do in the moment, kind of like Jake did for a moment of stress. So I think of the sky breath meditation as conditioning your nervous system, kind of like Go to the gym, strengthen your muscles so you can be strong in life. It's conditioning your nervous system so you can be more calm and stress resilient in life, which is some of my colleagues at Harvard did a study with sky breath meditation. And they found that in stressful situations, people reacted with less of a stress response. So it's sort of conditioning you for greater calm. But so that's like conditioning your nervous system. But if you want an in the moment right now technique, because I'm about to go do some an interview or I want to calm down from what just happened, you know, then you can um, 
do something very simple, which is just to extend your exhales. So like you breathe in, when you breathe in, your heart rate increases. And when you breathe out, it slows down. Mm -hmm. So if you breathe in for a count of four and out for a count of eight, and you do that for five minutes, you know, with your eyes closed, you'll immediately see a difference. All right. So I have a little bit of a tangent. I want to go on just for a second here because I, you know, I have a research scientist (laughs) on the podcast and you cite a lot of research in your book and as someone who's like written books and who give keynotes, I'm always kind of looking for research. And I've kind of, I feel like nowadays you could find a study to justify almost anything. And I'm curious from your perspective as a professional, what's a good way to sort of vet what research is actually legit versus what research, like how do you, when you look for something to back up a claim that you're thinking about, yeah. or a hunch that you have. Walk us through your process. Ideally, you want to find a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis, mm-hmm. let's say you're looking at, I wonder if meditation is good for the immune system. Right. You want to find a meta, you may find, you know, Joe Blow did one study on this and it's significant. Yay, you know, and in a journal I've never heard of. So I'm going to quote it, you know, okay, you can do that, but Ideally, you want to look at a meta-analysis, which is looking at meta-analysis, rigorously seek out like 10, 20, 30 studies that they vetted for quality that have enough participants and so forth. And they bring it together and they do, they, they draw, they can, the conclusions they draw are going to be more. Um, Scientifically sound. Telling. Yeah. So I like to look, you know, so I, 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 I like to look for meta-analyses. Is there a database where you can find meta-analysis? So you just have to Google it? or You can just Google meta-analysis. Let's say you're looking at the effect of alcohol on brain function. You know, you're mm-hmm. going to find some meta-analyses on that. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just want to kind of go through some of the things that I saw in your book that stood out. You took social media and email off of your phone. And what was what was the effect of that? Because that's something that I think a lot of people mm-hmm. think about as well. I'm getting all these Oh, my gosh. Oh, it gives you so much, you know, you don't, I think we realize if we're aware, if, you know, if you're build up your awareness because you're meditating and you're just really reflective, you'll notice that you feel tethered to your phone. Maybe you carry it around everywhere and you're not an MD who's waiting for a possible emergency call from the hospital, right? Like mm-hmm. my friend right now, she's, she's three centimeters dilated. It's going to give birth here any moment. So like I have my phone on cause I could, so I can hear if she calls me and needs me, but um, yeah, I realized, okay, I don't like being hooked on the social media. I don't, and I can tell how it's trying to hook me. Cause when I, for example, if I go through to Instagram on my website, on a website, I'm not hooked in there. I just go in, check my messages, respond, leave. Like I don't need to, I'm not stuck. Why is the app so addictive? It's programmed that way. I don't want that. I, I don't want anyone programming me into sucking more of my time out of me that I want to give to this thing. So it's more addictive I took than it off text, my phone. You I say, took all of them off my phone and I was. It's more addictive to sex than sex, you say, statistically in the book. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, there's a research study that showed it. It's not a meta analysis, but <laughs> there's a research study that showed that the impulse to check your phone is greater than the impulse for sex. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, what I found is like, gosh, it freed up so much of my, my mind space. And then I was like, I think I'm just going to take email off too. And that was just like, wow, I got my life back. This is amazing. And, you know, um, we, I've met CEOs who do this. I'm like, okay, if a CEO can take email off their phone, like how important is it for you to have your email on your phone constantly? You know, Mm -hmm. if it's bugging you, if it's not bugging you, if it's not an app, you find yourself compulsively checking them, forget about it. It's not a big deal, but anything you find yourself compulsively drawn to look at that. It's taking away your freedom. It's taking away your sovereignty. It's binding you. Do you want to play with that? Do you want to do you want to play in that in that world, or do you want to free yourself from it? And what are some of the alternatives? Let's say you you have all this time now because you've taken those notifications off. What do you yeah. recommend people do to enhance their sovereignty? Oh, and so in the much. book, you talk about different areas, right? You talk about relationship, you talk about intuition, you talk about the body. So I guess just a cross section of some of these different techniques, such as going outside, being in nature, et cetera. Yeah. 
You know, if you spend time with a child, a little child under seven that has not been put on a screen yet, they live so fully in the present moment. And there is so much joy and energy and creativity. The most creative people on our planet are children under under seven or eight, right? Or 10. And, you know, when you look at the research on happiness too, we are never happier than when we're in the present moment. That's what the, the data shows. That the happiest moments you experience are the ones when you are so fully present with what you're doing. But not just that. That's also when your brain is in, is in, is more likely to go into flow state or in an alpha wave state where you're more likely to come up with innovative ideas, intuitions. That's what the data shows. And I like to prioritize that. Like if I go into the woods or I go walk around the block, I like not having my phone on. I like just being. We live in a society that is so addicted to doing that we'd rather give ourselves electric shocks than sit in a room and do nothing. There was a study that showed that. People were like, hey, you're going to get paid 20 bucks to be in the study. You're going to sit in this room and do nothing or you can give yourself electric shocks that you previously um, rated for a very as very aversive. And people were just sit there and give themselves electric shocks. You got to wonder what the heck is going on. We're so bound and so disconnected from ourselves that we can't even be with ourselves. And that's, and that's why it's so important that what you're doing and encouraging people to meditate because we have, how can we live so disconnected from ourselves, you know? And yet it's in those moments when we are more present, I find, I find them to be the most blissful moments and the most meaningful moments and also the most inspired moments. Cause that's when I think of, or the most sort of inspired thoughts come into my mind. And I, I take it as such a valuable opportunity each time. You do a silent meditation every few months. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how do you, do you go to the same place? Do you go to different places? What's that? So like? I found that the art of living practices really work for me. And they offered these silence retreats again on zoom over a weekend, or you can do them in person, but I found that the ones on zoom work great too. And hmm. I could just be in my room and tell my family, hey guys, I'm going to play Quiet Mouse this weekend, okay? <laughs> and, um, but you do this just guided meditations. They're very specific ones um, that are really powerful. They're um, very, uh, you just feel like you've got a huge load off your back every time you take you take a, a retreat like that. But what I realize is that I come back with a mind, my mind is so clear and I feel like I've rested. Like you can go on vacation and come back and be exhausted from it. I just feel like I I'm energized um, and rested and, and uh, I have a lot of inspiration, you know, I'm a writer and I have a lot of inspiration that comes to me in those, those retreats. So, but I found with little kids, I was burning out. I had little kids later. My second I had at 41. So I just had a lot of fatigue in my system. And when I do this every two, three months, I just feel like my batteries are charged and I can go, but also every time it just feels like, my mind is lighter. Like I have, I've combed through more like trauma or whatever else from my background. It's just, I'm clearer and lighter and more present and I'm more inspired, but That's it's cool. radical in our time. It's radical to sit and do nothing for three days. It's considered what's wrong with you. Like, why aren't you being productive? They don't realize that our brain is actually in active problem solving mode and most innovative when we are silent. I think a lot of my audience, they do meditate and, um, yeah. and a lot of them are moms. And one of the biggest questions I've gotten as a meditation advocate over the years is how do I get my kids to meditate or why wasn't my husband, you know, do this practice? So what are some of the tips that you have for people listening to this who would like to share this with their family? But obviously, if you try to force people, they're, they're going to reject it. So what have you discovered in terms of introducing this to others? Well, I've had people tell me, I don't care what you say. I want what you have. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I, I, I'm kind of that way too. I'm just like, I have a show me attitude. It's like, if you're going to tell me to meditate and you're like a neurotic, crazy person, I don't want to meditate. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you show up in life in a way that goes, gets me going, whoa, they got something going on. That's what I want to follow. Right. And so we have to show by example, because like you said, no one wants to be told what to do. So don't push, but do pull through your, through how you show up. And I think if your kids are small enough, they are already open to learning some breathing exercises. 
sign them up for some classes. My kids are six and nine and they've already done a couple of classes. I do. Have, I, again, I'm just, I, I use the art of living classes because they work for me. And, um, but there's, uh, I always, yeah, I believe in pull, don't push because that's how I operate. I don't want anyone pushing me around. And I understand that nobody really wants that. Um, but if you show up calmer, you are teaching them that they too can do so. If you are doing your breathing exercises when they see that you're exasperated, or if you sit and close your eyes, my kids, they know, okay, dad, where's that? He's upstairs meditating. Okay. Where's mom? She's upstairs meditating. It's just normal in our family that, and so you're also just giving them a, a model for this is what adults do in the morning before they go to work. Mm -hmm. Do you all have like a family meditation time or you kind of, everyone does their own thing and go, one person goes in the closet, one person goes in the bathroom, one person <laughs> play room. I love that. Um, no. And again, I, I don't really force my kids to do their meditation, but you know, the other day I was meditating and then my oldest son comes in really mad and stomping around and sits on my lap and dad won't let me do this. And I was like, all right, all right come on, let's go. Let's, let's do our little breathing, you know, and we did our breathing. And med and then after it's like, how do you feel? He's like, I feel great. I was like, so, okay, let's go back downstairs, you know. Um, but they discover for themselves, they're so smart, you know, they see, mm -hmm. you know, how they feel. Yeah. But no, we don't, I don't make the, but both of my husband and I both every morning, because we know we're going to show up as better parents. So we know we're going to show up just happier, less reactive. Does he do the silent retreats as well? He's done a couple. Nice. I've made him go. I was like, Hey, I think you should go. <laughs> um, and then, uh, the sky breath meditation he does every day. Yeah. He's actually a veteran. Um, so, and he, he learned that practice and yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So last couple of questions, what do you mean by gratitude is a lifeboat? Yeah. Gratitude is a lifeboat. You know, you can go through such hard times and you can get so down but gratitude keeps you afloat. You know, it's so easy to think my life sucks. Everything's wrong. Nothing's right. I can't do anything. It's so easy to get trapped in that tunnel of negativity and it's leading you nowhere, nowhere good. And gratitude is remembering, am I breathing? Oh yeah, I am. I'm alive. Okay. I'm alive. Is the sun shining? Okay. The sun shining. Okay. Did I have a meal today? Okay. I had a meal today. Okay. Did I sleep in a bed last night? I slept in a bed. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a lot of things that are going right for me. Even if life's really hard and even if I've got bills and even if I just lost my job and even if I, you know, things are hard, but there's always something. And the wisest people you'll meet, you know, if you think back on some people in your life that, you know, oftentimes they've been through hard times, by the way, they live with gratitude and that is going to keep you afloat going to keep you smiling. It can, it's going to keep your hope up, your faith up. It's going to keep you positive. And it's also going to help you lift up everyone around you. Let's say you are a parent and you're in this deep, dark despair. Well, your kids are also going to be that because that's what they're learning from you. It's like when I grew up in France, I was like, everybody's so freaking negative. You just think that's how it is. It's not how it is. That's how a mindset is. It doesn't have to be like that. And gratitude gives you the energy to keep going. But from a scientific perspective, it decreases anxiety, decreases depression, <laughs> increases your, your well-being, benefits your relationships, improves your sleep. There's a lot for the scientific perspective, too. Do you recommend a specific gratitude sort of exercise or practice that people can do? You know, people, you know, research has shown, write three things down that you're grateful for every day. And then that has a more of an impact than an antidepressant. Mm hmm you can do that. I don't, I don't do it that way, but I, I keep it at the forefront of my mind a lot. And I use it in my family too. I'm like, Hey, let's, let's stay grateful here. Like, you know, let's, let's please stay grateful. <laughs> and at night before we go to sleep, we go around and say what we're grateful for. And, uh, my little guy goes, I'm grateful for mama and dada. And I'm grateful for Michael. And I'm grateful for me, Christopher. <laughs> and I'm just like, yes, he's got that self-love going on, which I'm proud of. <laughs> Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. I've also found um, a sort of sneaky way to talk about gratitude that's a little bit more, I think, uh, 
in alignment with how we're sort of culturally indoctrinated to view success and things like that. Yeah. Is, and I do this with my partner almost every day. We talk about what was the highlight of your day? You know, what were some of the highlights of your day? Because indirectly you're, you're saying I'm grateful for these experiences, yes. whether it was going to the gym and achieving a certain, you know, personal record or the meal that we shared or, you know, so you just kind of, you, you can create or those feelings of gratitude without necessarily calling it gratitude, which, yes. which some people may seem as, see as like a cheesy type of thing. I'm just sit around and think yes. about what you're grateful for, but thinking about what you are, what, what were the highlights and why were those highlights of your day? I think it'd be kind of a fun way to also drop into that feeling tone of gratitude. I love that. I love that highlights because some people think gratitude is like just to pacify the masses and keep them, you know, <laughs> someone, mm -hmm. they may, there was someone who wrote an article on that. I think in New York times or somewhere where they were just like, it's just a tool to pacify people and make them complacent. And it's like, okay, no, it's not, <laughs> but it does keep you focused on what's going right rather than drowning in what's going wrong. I love that. In the highlights. You know, and that's, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I hear a lot of these, these very quote successful marketers and internet, you know, influencers, they talk about, there's no point in, in striving for happiness or striving for fulfillment. Um, just try to make as much money as possible. And, and as you, as you begin to achieve things, you'll start to feel more confident. You'll start to feel better inside. And I liken that to suggesting that there's no way to be materially successful. <laughs> Right. It's just, it's too difficult. It's almost impossible, but there right. is a playbook. If you want to make a lot of money, there are very specific things that you can do to achieve that. And the same is true for happiness. If you want to be more fulfilled, if you want to have more of that inner peace that we're talking about, there are very specific things that you can do to achieve that. The only problem is we don't treat it as we don't give it the same priority level as we may give trying to become materially successful and it's not one or the other. It's not, they're not mutual. They're, they're not mutually exclusive. Like you can do both at the same time, but you have to give yes. it the same level of intention that you may give to trying to become successful and wealthy. And so I think a lot of times people may hear this and mistake it as an anti prosperity message, but really it's a pro self-awareness message is a pro inner fulfillment message and the mm -hmm. more self-awareness the more peace the more fulfillment you have the the more you appreciate the material stuff and the more you can use it for good in constructive ways because you know they talk about how it's an amplifier of whatever you got going on inside so and abundance is really a matter of consciousness it's not really a matter of of how much money you have. You can have yes. all the money in the world and still feel like you don't have enough. Or you can be one of those people in India, China, Tibet, Africa. Doesn't have a lot materially, but they feel yes. more connected to what's, what's happening around them, their family, their friends, more grateful. And they feel like the richest person ever, right? And I think that's, that's right. we're looking for kind of a combination of those things. Just keeping it real. Like you got to pay your bills. Life is expensive on planet Earth, particularly in America. But you also want to uh, understand that there is a roadmap that you can systematically become aware of all the areas where you've abandoned your sovereignty and you can reclaim that, but you have to be yeah. intentional about it. And I think this book is an amazing place to start. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Is there anything else you would like to say, or we left out or that you feel people should know is there maybe a next step, obviously getting the book, but if there's something that, that you, you feel, and I know you probably don't like these, you know, let's boil it down this bottom line yeah. <laughs> type of questions, just get the book, read the whole thing. Um, but realistically, most people aren't going to get the book, you know, the lucky ones will, and they'll get a chance to, to experience the context, the contextualized version of this conversation. But what's something that people can do until they, until they move into the awareness that, hey, I need to do a little bit more? Um, stay grateful, meditate, and, you know, immerse yourself in wisdom. You know, our, our society gives us a lot of junk media, uh, so much abundance of that. 
what up what about wisdom we we are sitting on treasure troves of wisdom from every culture and civilization over the millennia that humans have existed on this planet you know whether you're diving into rumi poetry or going into your own tradition whatever that is and or another tradition explore what wisdom has meant for humans and you know living life with that lens of wisdom is is exactly what you're offering light through your work and is what is going to really help you decide for yourself how do i want to live this life what do i want to emphasize you know there's so many options even poetry like maya angelo's poetry like that is not what is currently being offered in our society we have just a lot of entertainment but consider consuming things that bring you greater lightness more more joy more humor more perspective more awareness and i would add also from your book to give yourself permission to be idle more often than yes. you're probably doing so Very right important. now mm -hmm. not even just meditating just sitting around like like einstein like you said just listening to music or going for a That's walk right. or it, yeah it puts you in that like earlier when you were saying what do I do when I'm not on my phone or whatever? I mean, in those moments that I'm not working to just be, have my mind be in this idle space as I walk without my phone or spend time with children, just being, just being. I love it. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much again for sharing your perspective on sovereignty and, uh, and for all of the work that you've contributed to this, this understanding of, fulfillment and of awareness and uh well, and thank you to hopefully for getting me. a chance to cross paths maybe on the speaking circuit or something at, at some point in the near future if you like that video you're gonna love the next one click this thumbnail right here and i'll see you over there